Good evening and welcome to the special vote 2014 edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight's show is a debate sponsored by Clean Elections. We'll hear from candidates competing for Arizona Secretary of State. As with all of Arizona Horizon's debates, this is not a formal exercise. It's an open exchange of ideas. It's an opportunity for give and take between candidates for one of the state's most important offices. As such, interjections, even interruptions are allowed, provided that all sides get a fair shake, and we will do our best to make sure that that happens. The Secretary of State is Arizona's chief elections officer and the first in line to succeed a sitting governor in the event that that governor cannot complete a term, something that seems to happen with some regularity here in Arizona. Two candidates are competing to be Arizona's next Secretary of State. They are in alphabetical order. Democrat Terry Goddard, a former Arizona Attorney General, and Republican State Senator Michelle Reagan. Each candidate will have one minute for opening and closing statements. Earlier we drew numbers to see who goes first, and that honor goes to Terry Goddard. Thank you, Ted, and thank you to Clean Elections for providing this, this discussion opportunity. Um, I'm running for Secretary of State because Arizona election system is a mess. We're 46 in the nation in participation, and we're falling like a rock. Uh, groups, entire groups, are being shoved out of the process, starting with independents, the largest group of voters in our state who have a terrible time getting a vote, uh, a ballot in the primary. Um, dark money, uh, that anonymous corporate cash that seems to be having its way with our elections, uh, is flooding into the state of Arizona, and that causes voters to be discouraged because how can you know your vote counts when you're not sure who's arguing on one side or the other? Legislature hasn't really helped very much. Uh, last year they passed a voter suppression bill, which among other things would have tried to extinguish the Libertarian Party from statewide elections. I believe the next Secretary of State has to be absolutely committed to knocking down the barriers and to making sure that dark money is stopped in the state of Arizona. Thank All right. you, Ted. Thank you very much. For the next opening statement, we turn now to Michelle Reagan. Well, thank you. It's so wonderful to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Michelle Reagan and current state senator and I am really thrilled to be running for Secretary of State. I'm, I'm extremely uh, excited and passionate about two areas um, of law and two areas that I've worked on extensively at my 12 years down at the Capitol. And those two areas have been business law and election law. I was chair of the elections of the uh, Commerce Committee when I was in the House for eight years. And now that I'm in the Senate, I am chair of the Elections Committee. And when you look at the role of Secretary of State, those are the, the primary, that's uh, the primarily the role of what the Secretary of State is, is business filings and elections. And so I like to think that just about everything I've been doing at your state capitol the last 12 years has tailored me to make a, an excellent Secretary of State. So I'm very excited about the, uh, the vision and plans I have for the office. All right, very good. Thank you both. Let's get it started here. Terry, we'll start with you. What is your vision uh, for Secretary of State, and how much vision should there be with the state's chief uh, elections officer and record keeper? Well, I think we have a lot to make up for, Ted. So um, a certain amount of vision is critical. A certain amount of vision, and my vision is for an inclusive system, one that makes sure that all legally uh, eligible citizens have a chance to vote. Uh, an equal chance, that there's no discrimination against the D and R and I or whatever, whatever number that comes after, letter comes after your name. Uh, I, th I think that's absolutely critically important and the system has to be absolutely fair and the voters have to know that. Uh, sometimes, re recently, we've had secretaries of state uh, doing political stunts or endorsing political candidates in a way that uh, makes the voters from the other side feel, well, maybe their, their participation is as welcome. And I mentioned in the open, independence. Uh, my vision includes independents as full, equal players in this process. Right now, they're not. Uh, they have to petition for a ballot in the, in the primary. Don't get one by mail automatically. And if they want to run for statewide office, they need 33,000 signatures, and a Republican or Democrat only need about 7,000. That's not fair. Your vision for this office? We have put out an extensive plan on things that we would like to do, and we've broken it down into 100 days and things that we can accomplish in the first year. Can you imagine roving kiosks, voter registration kiosks, in schools, high schools, and in colleges that register young people to vote? So that on their 18th birthday, they receive a voter registration card from the state. Imagine independents being able to skip that extra step that they have right now and be able to get their early ballot the same way that other parties receive their early ballot automatically. Imagine 
a voter rights ambassador, if you will, out in the community working to make sure voting rights aren't trampled in communities where they're having problems with, with voting. Imagine a system, there's new software out there to allow citizens to be able to verify the vote. There is so much exciting technology, exciting news in the elections world. I, 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 and Terry Goddard over here kind of mentioned discrimination and, and mentioned that being perhaps a problem as far as uh, the election landscape. Do you see that as an issue, as a problem? Well, we see, especially let's take for example um, on the Navajo Reservation. When we come up with things on the state level or in the, in the county level, and some of it is um, new and interesting stuff, take for example the permanent early voting list. You need to go and then educate people, sometimes in their own language. And when we go and visit other counties and visit other areas, sometimes they don't know about the new tools that are available and access to the um, different ways to vote, only because it hasn't been spoken to them or educated to them in their language. So there's barriers that perhaps we don't know about because people aren't out visiting these communities. You mentioned discrimination. What did you mean? I, I mean very serious discrimination. I mean against students who uh, have to vote a federal ballot. They're treated as second-class citizens in the state of Arizona. Uh, I'm talking about independents uh, who, as we've agreed, have to, have to petition for a uh, ballot every election to vote in the primary, as is their right. Uh, but I'm talking also about other f citizens that uh, in, uh, for instance, Senate Bill 1062 was an effort to discriminate against some of our fellow citizens, the gay and lesbian community. It seems to me that's absolutely wrong, and it is something that cannot be reflected in the Secretary of State's office. We have to make a clear statement that this, the office is totally fair, totally calls balls and strikes absolutely equally, and has no partisan uh, or other uh, discriminating factor, and that's not the way it's been played for the last 20 years. That's been, unfortunately, the legislature and the Secretary of State have worked together to set up a system that is, as I said, a mess. You voted for 1062. Why? 1062, bad vote. I mean, I voted for, I've been in the legislature 12 years, Ted, and by my rough calculations, I've cast over probably 10,000 votes. So I think it's kind of a little probably I would say inappropriate and perhaps a little unfair to go through and cherry pick you know in a little half an hour program to cherry pick a couple of votes and and you know if but if people it, what is I would if people think though it's a discriminatory bill and, what and, and would the, a chair, a chair, have to a, be a, discriminatory a chief elections officer election. wouldn't be fair if they voted for a discriminatory bill would you think that would be a, not a valid and argument 1062 would be discriminatory against people voting how I guess I would, how do you draw the nexus of well, 1062 discriminating I don't think this is the voting aspect, voting. it's discrimination and you being a chief. I'm, I'm talking about your critics here. I'm not, I'm not okay. debating you here. I'm talking about what others are saying, <laughs> including the, the gentleman across. Why don't you go ahead and say, because I don't well, want to take part in the debate. Civil rights is a package, Ted, and, and, and uh, Senator Reagan, um, because I think we know from experience in the, in the Deep South, uh, in the civil rights era, that... Uh, access to a lunch counter and access to an equal seat on a bus and voting rights are all tied up in the same package. So you can't say somebody doesn't get a full set of equal rights in one area and then say, oh, but by the way, it's okay for voting, because it isn't. But, but, but there, there are folks, critics on the other side, say the bill was mischaracterized. It, it basically designed to protect religious freedoms, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the Secretary of State's office. Oh, absolutely has everything to do with the Secretary of State's office, because the Secretary of State, if they're not, if the Secretary of State is not making it clear to all the citizens of Arizona that they are going to be absolutely fair in the execution of the voting laws, that every vote is counted and every individual is equal. Um, this, this, the, the message that goes out is going to have what we have today, which is a rapidly decelerating number of people participating because they have no confidence in Let me tell you what system. message is being sent, not today, but right now. The message is being sent is a hyper-partisan message and a message of let's take again, one vote, two votes, three votes, you can go through the 10,000 votes and find a couple, and let's blow them up and try to make people angry, and let's try to look backwards, and let's try to upset people, and that's the kind of stuff that turns people off from politics, from public policy, from government. The exact opposite of what a Secretary of State or Secretary of State candidate should be doing. Well, I've never when heard we're of 
legislative. When we're talking before. about the Office of Elections, it should be, of all the statewide offices, it should be the least partisan, the least let's go stir the pot office that there is. It should be the Office of Inclusiveness, the one that isn't trying to rally the base or anger and upset people. A hyper-partisan well, argument on your side. Respond, please. Not partisan at all. I mean, the opposition to 1062 was totally bipartisan. It and was Republicans and Democrats. Courageous of members of her party petitioned the governor to veto that bill. Three senators wrote a letter to Governor Brewer saying, you've got to do the right thing and veto what we just voted for. Uh, Senator Reagan was not one of those. Ted. I think basically what we're talking about here is not anything that was, was partisan. It was very bipartisan. Uh, Arizonans from every stripe and, and certainly the business community said emphatically, this is a mistake. This is leading us down the wrong road. So I'm not cherry picking anything. I'm saying this is something that unfortunately puts your stripe If the business community was so upset with me, do you clear. think I would be endorsed by every business community probably in our great state? I mean, the Chamber of Commerce, NFIB, the home builders, the realtors, you name it, are all supporting my candidacy. I mean, really, if, if the business community was, was thinking that I was out to, to destroy business in Arizona. The fact is that 1062 was misunderstood by just about everybody in our state. It was misunderstood by many members of the legislature. It was misunderstood by many in the media. It was misunderstood by a lot of people. I don't know what the intentions of the bill were. The fact is, as I have said, and it was printed in the paper, bad vote. I urged the governor to veto it. I was happy that she vetoed it. That was in the newspaper. We need to move on. This is a very short show. We have a half an hour to explain to voters what we want to do in the Office of Elections. Yes, we do. And that's why we're conducting a debate, and we will continue with that debate. Okay. It, it would be, you know. Are you okay with that? I would love to talk about Good. elections. Then let's do it. Uh, let's talk about the permanent early voting list. Sure. Should people be removed from the early permanent voting list if they're not voting early? Well, I think they need to have, uh, there, there needs to be evidence that they are not going to use this privilege, and it is a privilege. And I side with the county recorders who say we need to have some way, because right now they have no way to take somebody who is, for instance, medically incompetent. Uh, right now, even if you have a, a doctor's uh, certification that this, uh, you know, Mrs. Jones really doesn't have the capacity to vote, but she keeps getting a ballot, uh, I want to be able to have them with a certification stop that. I want to have somebody who clearly doesn't live at this location anymore uh, by, by return mail, I think they should be able to stop it. I think to purge somebody automatically for missing some elections, uh, and there's a dispute about how many elections, but the way I read 10, uh, 2063, excuse me, the, the, the <laughs> 2305, the, the bill that Senator Reagan proposed and passed, uh, was that it would have taken somebody who missed only one election in a sequence of four and put them on the list to be purged. Now that's, that's a subject to confusion because it's written so badly. Is that a good idea for Arizona, removing these people from these permanent early voting lists? I think that if people aren't voting and aren't using the early, their early ballots, then yes, they should be removed from the list if they don't vote in a lengthy period of time. So the way that the bill that I wrote was written is if you don't vote in four elections, then you're removed from the early ballot list. Um, Compared to other states that have similar laws, our law was actually written more generous. Uh, most states that I've looked at, if you miss um, two ele or one election, you're removed. In some states, um, just missing one election just automatically removes you from the list. And the reason for that is, is they don't want live ballots going to homes where people aren't going to be using them. Instead, that they'd either rather not vote by early ballot, they no longer live there, um, they've moved away, in some cases um, they're no longer living, um, or they prefer to go to the polls. So there's a reason for that, and people sometimes don't take the time to, to have themselves removed. Ted, our system does purge people who've died. That, that is not a problem in Arizona, and I support evidence-based removal from the list. It seems to me that if you're not living there, you shouldn't get a ballot there. If you're medically incompetent, you shouldn't get a ballot. What I don't like is this idea of automatically taking people 
off the, the, the list after a relatively small number of missed elections. Uh, independents in particular uh, tend to miss primaries and, and the system that was passed by Senator Reagan's bill could arguably have taken independents off when they missed one primary. I think that's wrong. A, a ban on mass ballot collections. Why is that good for Arizona? This is something I'm really passionate about. Um, I see no reason why any individual, whether it's a candidate themselves, a campaign operative, a party individual, um, myself, you, anybody, should be in possession of an extraordinary number of ballots. And right now the state law has no limits, no restrictions. You yourself could walk into a polling place on election day with 100 ballots and turn them in. There is no other state in the country that allows someone to do that. It is absolutely laughable. Um, the reason why is that not allowed? Why would anybody need to do that? It creates a system where there is an opportunity for fraud, and that is not acceptable. A laughable and unnecessary system. Respond, please. I think people have a right, if they're voting by mail, to get, to, to, if they want to trust a loved one or somebody else to take their ballot to the polling place, uh, they have a right. It's their right to vote that's at stake here. Um, I, I agree that uh, what uh, Senator Reagan occasionally, uh, occasionally calls harvesting is wrong and should, whatever that means should be abolished because it implies that somebody who's picking up ballots is picking and choosing. That's absolutely wrong. It's illegal under our system that exists today. You can't hold on to ballots under the system, under the law today, and I want to enforce that law vigorously. Critics say, though, that this, this ban on mass uh, ballot harvesting, if you would want to call it that, is, is, is a way to suppress the Latino vote. How do you respond to that? Well, that is um, not backed up by evidence at all. It's, you know, every, there's many groups that claim that they go out and collect ballots. And there's um, some groups that are uh, church groups that are going around and doing it. There's, um, it, I don't see it as a group that is um, based on any particular ethnicity. I, it's just something that I happen to not agree with. Um, again, no other state allows it, and I, I respectfully disagree, harvesting of ballots, of going around and c the collection of ballots in an unlimited quantity is legal in Arizona, and it is not allowed in any other state. The ability to go around as an individual and go door to door and say, I'm here to, to collect your ballot, would you like to hand it over to me? I have no problem with if you have an elderly neighbor or your husband says, here, can you take this to the polls with me? That can and should be able to be allowed in certain circumstances, but the ability right. to collect a thousand of them? Yes. Uh, no. Troubling to you as well? Well, I'd like to have some evidence that there was any fraud, and, and so far she's produced none. But the bottom line is, yes, I have the same reaction I think everyone does that a very large number of ballots in one person's hands just seems unhealthy. And we ought to be able to have some reasonable caps uh, consistent with evidence, consistent with saying a particular group is abusing the process, and I haven't seen that evidence. So let's, the... let's look carefully before we jump, because the thing that's at stake here is your right and my right to vote. And it seems to me under every circumstance we need to protect that right. When you have the head of the Maricopa County Elections, Karen Osborne, stand in committee and testify that there were people showing up at doors, people's doors with t-shirts made that said Maricopa County Elections and saying I'm with Maricopa County Elections and I'm here to collect your ballot. Only Maricopa County Elections doesn't do that. And not just one report, but a couple of reports of that happening. What does that tell you? I don't know. I think that would be fraud, and it should be prosecuted. So, so I've not I've, heard I've, of any cases catch, that were brought. You can't you, they, you know, they weren't able to, to catch the people because these are people picking up the phone and saying, uh, there was somebody well, just then, here, and we, we handed over our ballots to them. So just because somebody wasn't caught, but to, you, to put your head in the sand and say it's not happening, is also not this right. This is allegation and hearsay, but here's the important part. Um, there are, are the, those ballots that are mailed out in the Pebble system are traced, they're tracked, and, and they're verified by the signature of the person who is on the voter rolls that cast the ballot. Uh, so if we have a problem with custody, we should fix that, and we should make sure that custody from the voter to the polling place is absolutely intact. It seems to me that's the heart of the issue, and that's what I support. It seems to me that uh, 
We don't want to mess with people's right to vote. It has been done too often. We have tried to respond to what is supposedly a problem with, with restrictions that have had the result that I talked about initially. It's made our whole system a mess and it's made independents and others feel like they're not part of the process anymore. Is dual track voting necessary for Arizona? Unfortunately, it was necessary in this past election and hopefully it will be you know, not needed after the courts decide uh, what to do. And I think we, you have to take a kind of a step back and look at how that decision or why that decision was made. And that is because Arizona was caught between two laws or is caught between two laws that conflict with one another. Arizona is in a unique position, not a, not a um, necessarily good position, but being caught between two laws, one that the voters passed on the ballot, which says that voters need to show proof of citizenship when registering to vote. And another one that the federal government says, here's a federal form where you don't need to show proof. And so the dual track voting was something the Attorney General said, here's a solution that satisfies the need to satisfy two laws that conflict with one another. Is it necessary? It isn't. Uh, Attorney General Horn issued the opinion he's made a lot of mistakes in his short career as Attorney General, and I think this was one of them. I, I believe that the other, uh, let's see, 34 states that also have proof of citizenship have been waiting to see whether what the result of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals is going to be on this issue. It's in the court right now, and it seems to me we could have saved almost $2 million dollars that was spent implementing the dual track in the primary. I don't know how much it's going to cost us in the general, but $2 million to facilitate the votes of 21 people. Think of the cost per vote that that implies. And so this is an issue that we didn't have to do, and it cost us a huge amount of money in a state that's strapped for cash. I think it was impardonable, and it was simply unnecessary. Please. i just like to point out that the 34 states that um, Terry mentions are not in the same situation that Arizona is in because they didn't have laws that were voted on by the people. And when we have a law that is voted on by the people, remember that is very important. That is more um, higher standard. It is more important than a law that the legislature passes. And so that's what sets the other two states apart. Um, from the 34 states. Well, the legally, that really states. has nothing to do with it. The question is whether you follow the federal form or the state form. The other 34 states had the intelligence to wait and see what the courts would decide. And Arizona rushed to judgment, uh, put a very expensive system in place. We in Kansas are the only ones that are doing it. And frankly, I don't think we should be following Kansas. I disagree. When the people pass a law, I believe that it is much more important and it is of more importance than when the legislature passes a law. Okay, I think you referred to this earlier. Should the Secretary of State serve as a uh, state campaign chair for other candidates? Unequivocally not. Uh, it seems to me that, and we agree, I believe Senator Reagan and I are, are both emphatic about that. Um, I think Ken Bennett, a uh, very nice guy, very good singer, by the way, mm -hmm. um, I think made a serious mistake in being Mitt Romney's state chair for Arizona. And he made a serious mistake by a sort of theatrical effort to investigate the president's birth certificate. I mean, these are the kind of stunts that are unworthy of the Office of Secretary of State. I think it needs to be as close as we can get it to being totally fair and totally nonpartisan. You agree with that? I completely agree that um, you should keep campaigning out of the Secretary of State's office. Okay, um, last question here. We're getting close to closing statement time. Our little half hour show is almost <laughs> over. Um, are you qualified to be governor? I believe I'm qualified to do wherever I uh, end up serving. I will, I, wherever I'm called on to serve. I will be absolutely qualified given all the experience I've had in the legislature and then also my private sector experience that I've had growing a family business before the legislature. And that includes governor of Arizona? Absolutely. If I was called on to serve as governor, I would be just fine. Okay. <laughs> it, would, uh, it would be tough, but I would, I would be fine. Draw on all that experience that I had walking the halls of the Capitol and growing a small business. Are you qualified to be governor of Arizona? Yes, sir. I believe I am. How come? Well, as mayor of Phoenix, I had to meet a budget and work with the council and put together a, a very difficult situation, and we made it work. Uh, as attorney general, I represented all the agencies, but I think five in the state government. So I know their innermost thoughts, and I also know their problems. And I think that's a critical responsibility. I had to meet a budget. 
Um, it's a challenge, but the most important thing for me is that this is, this is a state that's in serious trouble. It's in trouble because its election system is in decay, it's in, in collapse, and we need to fix it. So that's the focus for me. All right. We'll stop it right there. Each candidate will now give us a one-minute closing statement. And going in reverse order of the opening remarks, we start with Michelle Reagan. Well, thank you. Again, thank you so much for having me tonight. You know, I look at opportunities like this and opportunities like traveling around the state as a one big job interview. And the position of Secretary of State is a job that I really want to do for you. It is something that I have been preparing for. I have the necessary background of the experience in the legislature and in growing my family's small business in downtown Phoenix. It is a job that I really want to do for you. And I ask for your support and for your vote on or before November 4th. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And next we turn to Terry Goddard. Thank you, Ted, and thank you, Clean Elections, for this opportunity. I think it's a remarkable public service. You know, as I think about the, the problems that we've talked about here today, that Arizona is facing, the, the, the lack of trust and the folks dropping away from our election system, I'm reminded of a similar problem that many of us faced in the city of Phoenix almost 30 years ago. Um, in those days, a small group controlled the city uh, and the citizens felt that they were not part of the system. In fact, big parts of Phoenix had never been represented on the city council. A small group of us decided we cared so much about our city, we wanted to try to change it. And we passed the district system, which replaced the at-large council with the district council. And we literally blew down the doors of city hall and brought citizen participation to a new high. Uh, that was an explosion of people being involved in their city. And I believe the state needs exactly that same formula and can, in fact, profit from the same kind of experience. I've had it, and I solicit your support and your vote for Secretary of State. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And thank you for watching this special Vote 2014 Clean Elections debate featuring candidates running for Arizona Secretary of State. Arizona Horizons' next debate will be tomorrow, October 8th, when we hear from candidates in the race for Congress in Arizona's 7th Congressional District. As a reminder, if you would like to watch tonight's debate again, this or any debate we have here on Arizona Horizon, and we got a bunch of them, you can check us out on the web, azpbs.org slash horizon. That's azpbs.org slash horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.